Well, good morning and welcome to our Bible study today. We're on the 60th book of the Bible, which is 1 Peter. But before we come to that, shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are such a great and mighty God. We thank you that you are over all things, that you have the whole world in your hands. There are things happening that we may not understand, Lord, but you know what's going on and you understand. And we pray, Lord, that you will meet with us this morning as we come around your word. We thank you for your word and we pray that you will help us to understand it, Lord, and Lord, learn more of you. It was written a long time ago, but it is relevant today as it was then, Lord. And we pray that you will quieten our minds and our hearts, that you will speak through it to each one of us. We ask these things in your name and for your sake. Amen. We're going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, the first chapter of this book. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, 
love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but a perishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. I don't think that door wants to stay closed this morning. But it's um, some very long sentences in that chapter and you have to sort of try and pick out what it is. But it's talking about the being born again to this living hope, this hope that we have, this certainty that we will one day be with God in glory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're talked about as being born again. It also talks about foreknowledge and being um, planned before the creation of the world. And it's, the prophets were looking forward to this day. They were prophesying in the Old Testament, we have them, but they didn't know when, when any of this was going to happen. And they were looking forward to it, but they weren't working for themselves. They were working for us today because we now know that the Lord Jesus Christ has been revealed. And then that's the calling for us to be holy as God is holy, to keep away from those worldly things. And it is the good news that was preached to you, he's reminding them. Let's have a look at an overview of this book, this epistle. The key word in the epistle is probably suffering. Not much happened, we we'll talk about suffering in chapter one, but there is some. And then the message then is how to suffer patiently, joyously, and to the glory of God. That seems rather odd. To suffer patiently, joyously, and to the glory of God. But that's what Peter is trying to get through in this gospel. Lots of verses here, but a key verse perhaps is 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. A great thing for us to remember that Satan is prowling around. And if we are trying to be holy, then he is looking for us, to devour us. If we're trying to be worldly, he's not interested. Now, this letter was written by Peter, probably towards the close of his life, around 64 AD. We know that from the verse, first verse, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, the portrait of Peter in the Gospels and in his own writings are amazingly and gloriously different. In the Gospels, Peter saw Jesus transfigured. In his writings, we see Peter transfigured by the boundless grace of God. Formerly, in the Gospels we read, he was impetuous, he was courageous, he was restless, he was buoyant, he was quick to meet personal slight and ambitious of earthly power. But later, in his writings, we see him patient, restful, forbearing, trustful, loving, and with the old buoyancy and courage purified and ennobled. It provides a telling illustration of the transforming power of the grace of God. This is the man who one moment said to Jesus, you are the son of God, and the next moment was denying ever knowing him and trying to tell him he mustn't go to the cross, he mustn't die, he won't let it happen, but then denying Jesus and keeping away from him. But now, he is an apostle, he's been beaten, he's been in prisons, um, possibly in prison at this time, we don't know. But he's been changed so much by the grace of God. So this is 30 or more years after the death and resurrection of Jesus that Peter is writing generally to Gentile Christians, though not exclusively, because there were many Jewish converts too. And these Christians were in Asia Minor, modern Turkey, we have the list of places at the beginning, um, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. And many of these churches had been established by Paul and his um, friends on many of his various journeys. 
And Peter was sending a spiritual message here of encouragement, instruction and admonition. And many of these young Christians, they may be old people, but young as Christians, they'd begun to think that perhaps Paul and Peter held different views on the fundamentals of the Christian faith. It's thought that Peter wrote this letter and sent it by the hand of Paul's companions, Sylvanus and Mark, to demolish that error, to stop it and say, no, we're preaching the same gospel. It was also intended to strengthen and encourage these Christians who were passing through trials and bitter persecution. So in writing this letter, Peter obeyed two specific commands that Jesus had given him. Firstly, to encourage and strengthen the church. In Luke 22, 31 to 32, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And then secondly, to feed the flock of God. And you remember that occasion, um, Peter had denied knowing Jesus three times, and after Jesus' resurrection, around the fire, um, when they'd been fishing, and Jesus said these words. When, Jesus, when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He, Jesus, said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. We don't know exactly where Peter was writing from, but a hint is given in this letter. In 1 Peter 5.13, he said, She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. It's believed that the reference to Babylon would be understood to mean Rome. The Old Testament prophets often used Babylon as a symbol of Satan's kingdom. And Peter writes in this letter of various aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ's character. And those are, he is the source of hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And when the Bible talks about hope, it's not talking about it might happen. This is a certainty, a certain hope. Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. Chapter 1, verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He describes Jesus as the chief cornerstone. In chapter 2, verse 6, for it stands in Scripture, says, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Jesus is the perfect example to us all. In chapter 2, 21, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. Jesus is also the ideal sufferer. In chapter 2, 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to those to him who judges justly. He is our sin bearer. In chapter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And Jesus is the shepherd of our souls. In chapter 2, 25, For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul, souls. And finally, he is the exalted Lord. 
in chapter 3, verse 22. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers having been subjected to him? We have there the whole gospel, really, and the example of Jesus Christ and what Jesus did for us. So an analysis of looking at this book. As mentioned earlier, the key word of this epistle is suffering. And this word, or its equivalent, is found about 21 times in this short letter. And it gives the message of the book. The sufferings of Christ are referenced to in every chapter of 1 Peter. But interestingly, never once in 2 Peter. And we'll find out a bit more about that next time. So firstly, we're able to rejoice in suffering because of our salvation. And so in the first section, chapter 1, verses 1 to 13, there's the salutation, the usual salutation that we have, who wrote, who wrote it and who it's to, and then usually, may grace and peace be multiplied to you, or something of those words. And this glorious salvation, which is ours through grace, enables us, through suffering and trial, to rejoice with joy unspeakable and with great hope. So we are able to rejoice in suffering because of our salvation and because of that hope that we have. Secondly, we should suffer innocently and to the glory of God. Holiness is essential. And this is chapter 114 to 322. The imperative need and necessity for holiness of heart and life underlies all that Peter writes. The future inheritance is really an incentive, incentive rather, to live a holy life. And he's anxious that none should by careless and sinful conduct merit persecution and suffering. So that's what he means by he should, we should suffer innocently. We should be suffering for our faith, for what we believe, not wrong things that we have done. I mean, it is right that we suffer for wrong things we've done, but we should be suffering for our faith. And he goes on, loose living exposes us to the scorn of the enemies of the cross. So when we get it wrong, people are very quick to shout. We see that in politics. When someone gets it wrong, other side is very quick to shout, even if they've got it wrong as well. But that's how it is. So we should be very careful how we live our lives. And we should respond to suffering in a godly way. But remembering that Jesus was silent before his, um, those who accused him. He didn't say anything. He didn't shout back. He didn't argue. He didn't have a defence. He just took it. In our suffering, thirdly, we have fellowship with our Lord. This is chapter 4. And the thought Peter gives here is that provided the life is right, in suffering... We are in blessed fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Never suffer as evildoers, as he indicated before, but when called to suffer, glorify God and commit our souls into his keeping. Remember Stephen being stoned to death. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Could you say that if you were being stoned to death for your faith? quite a lot, but that is in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, who did say exactly the same. Then fourthly, in suffering, never forget the glory which will follow. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. One blessed comfort in sorrow and trial is the thought of the future. Clothe yourselves with humility, which is verse 5, is literally put on humility like a slave's apron. Accept the suffering for your faith because you know what is coming in the future. Yes, I mean, we, d we don't live in a place where we could be put to death because we are Christians, because we come to church, because we read the Bible, because we pray, because we share the gospel with others. We're not likely to be put to death for that. But there are people who are. And they are suffering like that and knowing that they could easily be put to death but they should know what is coming afterwards, the thought of the future. And fifthly, he says, remember suffering is common 
to all of us. In chapter 5, 6 to 14, it's not good to imagine that we suffer more than others. In fact, we know in this country we don't. But there's always someone who is suffering worse than us. And the fact is that we have in verse 19 that suffering and sorrow are experiences that are common to us all. None are exempt. And we should be persevering in that suffering. And then as the epistle, the letter, comes to an end, we have that verse that we read at the beginning, that warning about the devil, that he is prowling around like a lion, wake, waiting to pounce on someone. And if we are living as Je the example that Jesus gives us, then we are safe. But if not, he will pounce and he will cause trouble for us. He is there, he is real. And then there's the benediction and the greeting at the very end. Peace to all of you who are in Christ, he says. So that's a look at 1 Peter. We're now going to have a look at the film and that puts it um, in a slightly different way for us to un understand um, Peter, this, this um, person and the epistle. The first letter of Peter. His name was Shimon, or Simon, when he first became a follower of Jesus, and he was part of the inner circle of the twelve disciples. When he made his confession that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus changed his name to Kephas, which is Aramaic for rock, which was later translated into Greek as Petros, or Peter. Jesus promised that he would become a leader among the apostles to guide the Messianic community in Jerusalem through its earliest years, and that's what happened. Remember the early chapters of the book of Acts. Eventually, Peter was called to carry the good news of Jesus beyond the borders of Israel, however, and this letter was written decades into that mission in the wider Roman world. We discover at the conclusion of this letter that Peter is in Rome, which he calls Babylon, and we learn that while Peter commissioned the letter, it was actually composed by a man named Silvanus, who was a co-worker of Peter. This was a circular letter sent to multiple church communities in the Roman province of Asia Minor, which is in modern-day Turkey. And Peter learned that these mostly non-Jewish Christians were persecuted. They were facing hostility and harassment from their Greek and Roman neighbors. And so Peter wrote to encourage them in the midst of their suffering. And this helps explain the letter's design and its main themes. It opens with a greeting, and then it moves into a poetic song of praise to God, which introduces the key themes that are explored in the main body of the letter, where he first First affirms the new family identity of these persecuted Christians, which will help them see their suffering as a way to bear witness to Jesus. And this has a way of focusing their future hopes on the return of Jesus. Let's dive in. You'll just see how all the pieces work together. So Peter opens by greeting these churches as the chosen people of God who are exiled around the world. Now Peter makes clear throughout the letter that these Christians he's writing to are Gentiles. But here he describes them with phrases from the Old Testament that describe how how God chose the people of Israel, the family of Abraham, who was himself an exile and wanderer. This is a key strategy that Peter repeats through the whole letter. He wants these suffering non-Jewish Christians to see that through Jesus, they now belong to the family of Abraham. And so they're wandering exiles just like him, misunderstood, they're mistreated, and they're looking for their true home in the promised land. Peter continues this idea in the opening song. He praises God for causing people to be born again into a living hope through Jesus' resurrection and the power of the Spirit. God's inviting all people into a new family centered around Jesus, a family that has a new identity as God's beloved children and who have a new hope of a world reborn by God's love when Jesus returns as king. And for people who have this hope, suffering and persecution is actually a strange gift because it burns away false hopes and distractions like a purifying fire, and it reminds us of our true home and hope. And so paradoxically, life's hardships actually deepen our faith. They make it more genuine. From here, Peter's going to move on into the body of the letter, but he's going to explore all these ideas in greater depth. 
So he first develops the theme about the new family identity of God's people. He takes even more memorable Old Testament images about the family of Israel, and then he applies them to these Gentile Christians. So like the Israelites who left Egypt, they too are to gird up their loins and leave behind their former way of life on the way to a new future. So they are the holy people of God now who are journeying through the wilderness. They are the people of the new Exodus who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, who's the ultimate Passover lamb. They are the people of the new covenant who have God's word buried deep inside them, restoring their hearts and renewing their minds. They are the new temple built on the foundation of Jesus himself. And they're the new kingdom of priests who are serving God as his representative to the nations. Now, by applying all of these amazing images to these persecuted Gentile Christians, Peter is placing their suffering within a brand new story. And this leads into the next section. Their persecution can actually help bring clarity to their mission in the world, to bear witness to God's mercy among the nations. So Peter first encourages them to submit to Roman rule, even if it's oppressive. Yes, he acknowledges their persecution, their suffering is unjust. But violent resistance solves them nothing, not to mention that it betrays the teachings of Jesus who loved his enemies instead of killing them. Peter then specifically highlights the very difficult situation that Christian slaves and wives faced when they lived in Roman households where the patriarch did not follow Jesus. The problem was that it was expected that everyone in the household would submit to and worship the patriarch's gods. And so Peter's aware that giving allegiance to Jesus will generate suspicion. So Peter says it's true. All Christians, including Roman wives and slaves, have been fully liberated by Jesus. But they are to demonstrate that freedom, not through rebellion, but by resisting evil the same way Jesus did, through showing love and generosity to your enemies. And in homes where the husband is also a Christian, it's a different story. They are to treat their wives totally different from their Roman neighbors, regarding them as equals before God who are worthy of honor and respect. And Peter's hopeful that this imitation of Jesus' love and upside-down kingdom will give power to their words as they bear witness to God's mercy and show people the beautiful truth about the way of Jesus. But Peter's also a realist. He knows that Christians will continue to be persecuted, and so he reminds them of their future vindication. He recalls how Jesus himself was unfairly persecuted and murdered by corrupt human powers, but in reality, he was dying for the sins of his enemies. And afterward, he was vindicated and given recognition resurrection life by the Spirit. And now Jesus is exalted as king over all human and spiritual powers. Then Peter shows how baptism points to the vindication of Jesus' followers. So like Noah, they've been saved through the waters, not as a magic ritual, but as a sacred symbol that shows their change of heart, their desire to be joined to Jesus in his death and his resurrection. And so now, even if they are murdered for following Jesus, their hope is in future vindication and exaltation alongside their king. Which leads Peter into the final movement. He recalls Jesus' words that his disciples should consider it an honor and joy to be persecuted just like he was. Peter then calls on church leaders to care for these suffering Christians and to show the same kind of servant leadership that Jesus did to his followers. And finally, Peter reminds these Christians about the real enemy that they are facing. This hostility isn't simply cultural or even political. There are dark forces of spiritual evil at work inspiring hatred and violence and they are to resist this evil by staying faithful to Jesus and his teachings and by anticipating his return and ultimate victory over such evil. Peter concludes with a prayer for divine strength and he sends a greeting from the church in Rome, which he calls Babylon. Now this is cool. Peter's adopting here the tradition of the Old Testament prophets for whom the name Babylon became an archetype for any and every corrupt nation. And so Rome has become the new Babylon and its empire is where God's people are now exiled from their true home in the renewed creation. Peter's first letter is a powerful reminder of Christian hope in the midst of suffering. God's people have been a misunderstood minority from the very beginning, and they should expect to face hostility because they've chosen to live under the rule of a different king, Jesus. However, persecution can become a strange gift to the church because it offers a chance to show others the surprising generosity and love of Jesus, which is fueled by the hope of his return. And that's what 1 Peter is all about.